All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar today, which is entitled Tips, Tricks, and Shortcuts to Improve Productivity and Efficiency with TracePro. I'm Andrew Knight, and I have with me David Jacobson, our Senior Applications Engineer, who will be presenting today. The subject of the webinar will be an overview of tips and techniques for maximizing efficiency and results within TracePro. We will address all questions after the presentation. Dave will give you details on that. And so I guess with that, I will turn the meeting over to David. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Andy. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see some folks here for this, uh, this session. Uh, Today's webinar is going to be, it says about a 25 to 30 minute presentation on the screen there, but uh, from this morning session we actually ran to about 45 minutes or so, so it'll be a little bit longer than what's stated. And then we'll follow up the webinar with a question and answer session. So at any time during the webinar, please feel free to submit the, your, any questions you have using the question box in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. And then we'll look at all questions at the end of the webinar. I'll, I'll try and remember to remind everybody about this uh, a time or two as we go along. So once again, as Andy mentioned, the title of today's webinar is Tips, Tricks, and Shortcuts to Improve Your Productivity and Efficiency with TracePro. And what we're hoping to do today is, is maybe show you some things or some features about TracePro that you may not have known about, and hopefully everybody can kind of walk away from this with you know one or two new ideas on how to use the program. Uh, some of the topics we're going to be looking at today, uh, using simulation mode, how, when, and why, so how to set it up, when to use it. Uh, we'll look at determining the memory usage by TracePro, uh, using the Windows Task Manager and the TracePro Ray Trace report. So how to check how much memory your Ray Trace is going to take so you can avoid uh, running out of memory and potentially crashing uh, the program. Uh, we'll look at modifying multiple surface source properties at once uh, using the surface source editor. Uh, take a look at grouping and moving uh, system tree items, so objects in the system tree for better organization. We'll check out some display options and shortcuts to move and orbit the model. Then we're going to talk about detect rays starting in bodies. Uh, what is the setting, why you should use it, when you should use it, um, what's its role in TracePro. I'm going to show you a little bit on the irradiance maps and the candela plots and some of the tools you, that are available there uh, to get some more information out of your results. And then lastly, we'll wrap everything up. We'll look at the, the interactive optimizer in Trace Pro. I'll uh, give you a few little tips there as well. And along the way, we've got um, a few other topics sprinkled in there as well. As I said, we'll wrap this all up with a question and answer session. Uh, before we get going, uh, a couple little bits and notes here. Uh, in addition to this webinar, some additional resources if you want to find out more about TracePro. Uh, we have all of our past webinars archived on our website. So right here you can go and check out any webinars we have. Uh, we have our tutorial videos there as well. The TracePro tutorials, these are the printed uh, tutorials that we have, uh, as well as information on our training classes. And we run training here uh, typically three to four times a year. Uh, next session, I believe, is scheduled for mid-June, right after the SID show here in Boston. Uh, so we'd like to you know, have, invite everybody here. They want to come and check out training, some of the options we offer uh, here on site in Littleton. I also want to make a quick note here, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, current release of TracePro is TracePro 7.1.2. Uh, we've also just posted uh, the early access version of TracePro 7.1.3, so it has some, some bug fixes and some other enhancements in it. Uh, one quick note on that is that the early access release will overwrite your existing copy of TracePro. So if you want to keep TracePro 7.1.2 and download 7.1.3, I'd recommend you copy your, your 7.1.2 to a different folder so when, when 7.1.3 installs, it doesn't write over your previous version. And these can be downloaded by anybody with the current maintenance and support agreement just by going to our website, uh, www.lambdares.com. So with that out of the way, let's uh, start into today's webinar, Tips, Tricks, and Shortcuts to Improve Your Productivity and Efficiency with TracePro. First thing we're going to talk about is the simulation mode ray trace. And before I get to that simulation mode, I want to touch on the analysis mode ray trace. 
In analysis mode ray trace, this is the default ray trace you have in Trace Pro. So when you first open up a model and you start to run a ray trace, you're in what's known as analysis mode. And in analysis mode, the ray data is saved on every surface in the model and it's saved in RAM. Now the downside of this is it can use a large amount of memory, but the upside is it allows you to view plots such as, such as irradiance maps, 3D irradiance maps, and candela plots on any and every surface in the model at any time you want. Uh, a 32-bit version of Trace Pro is limited by Windows to using only 2 gig of RAM. So it's easy to exceed that RAM if you're running a large model or a complex model or a, a ray trace with a large number of rays. Uh, switching to a 64-bit operating system and a 64-bit version of Trace Pro will let you use as much RAM as you have on your computer. So this improves the situation, but once you get to large ray traces, you're, it's still possible to exceed the, the available RAM. Um, and 64-bit versions can use, I believe it's up to about 198 gig or somewhere around there, depending on the version of Windows you have. So the, the solution to this, if you're starting to run out of RAM, is to switch to simulation mode. Simulation mode ray trace in Trace Pro, the first thing you need to do is you're predefining an exit surface or surfaces where you want to save the ray, ray data. So you're telling Trace Pro in advance to save the ray data on specific surfaces. Once you've done that, you can then go in and choose, do you, in addition to the ray data, which would be your radiance maps, your incident ray tables, uh, do you also want to save the candela data and the ray path data? Ray path data will sort the, ray, sort the rays into discrete paths and then keep adding rays to each of those paths, each unique path from the source to your target surface. Uh, ray data is saved on the hard drive instead of RAM. So now your limit to the size of your ray trace is your hard drive, not the amount of RAM on your computer. Uh, I've run ray traces in excess of 100 million rays uh, using simulation mode. Simulation mode will create what's known as a, a SIM file or a .sim file in the same directory as your model. I always like to, to caution people here is that these SIM files, because you know, you're tracing a large number of rays, can get to be pretty large. And if your computer is set up to do an automatic backup and if you have any data limits, uh, you may want to keep an eye on your SIM files because sometimes it's very easy to exceed data limits uh, on your automated backups if you have a lot of SIM files saved in a directory that's, that's being backed up. Uh, and then the last thing on simulation mode here is that the rays are not shown. So you won't see the rays displayed in your model window when you're on a simula simulation mode ray trace. So let's take a look at actually setting up the steps it takes to set up a simulation mode uh, ray trace. And the first thing is we want to define an exit surface. And we can do this. We can choose the surface where we want to save the rays. In this model, it's this big black surface here. We do a right click, choose properties, and we'll open up the apply properties dialog box. And then we go to exit surface, and then click the box here next to exit surface and then click Apply. And if you expand that uh, item in the tree here, we'll see it, it'll say Exit Surface. And you can do this for each and every surface you want to have as an exit surface in your model. Uh, you have to have at least one, but there's no limit on the, the number that you can, you can define uh, in a model. Some of the options you have for a simulation mode ray trace, and these are found at ray trace, ray trace options, and then simulation and output. We can collect the exit surface data. This will be the information for the irradiance maps, um, incident ray tables, things like that, as well as candela data. We can tell it, do we want to save that angular distribution data? And then the path sort data. And the path sort data, as I mentioned, will allow you to, it will sort the rays into discrete paths and save that as a file. One comment on the collect path sort data option is that this can increase the ray time, ray trace time, because as it's running the ray trace, it's constantly sorting those rays into these discrete paths. So this is just, it's an extra step in the ray trace. 
If you're not going to be looking at that path sort uh, information, leave this unchecked. It'll make for a faster ray trace. Um, and in fact, the default setting is unchecked with the newest releases of Trace Pro. Uh, an area where you may want to see that path sorting data could be something like a uh, like a stray light analysis. So that one thing to keep in mind. It's it's normally unchecked, but if you want to start looking at that information, just go right into this simulation and output options and, and check that box. And the last step you need to do before you actually run the ray trace is switch Trace Pro from analysis mode to simulation mode. And you can do this by going to ray trace and then right down at the bottom just check next to simulation mode and it'll automatically switch from analysis to simulation mode. To start the ray trace, it's the same as an analysis mode. Either go to the, click the ray trace icon, or go to ray trace, trace rays. And when you do that, Trace Pro will put up this little information box, and it's, tell you, it's telling you what it's about to do. It's going to start in a simulation mode ray trace. The exit, exit surface data will be saved, and in this case, the candela data will be saved. Then click yes and the ray trace will go off and do what it normally does. And when you're finished, you can actually have access to all of the same uh, analysis tools as with analysis mode. In this case, I have a 3D irradiance map here open in the, the model window showing the, the true color output of this little LED light. I have a standard irradiance map open set to uh, display irradiance as well as the profiles. And then down here I have the candela plot open so I can see the angular distribution of my light. So you still have all the analysis tools available and your the accuracy is the same, it's just it's not saving that ray data to RAM and you don't have the display of rays in the window. So very good tool to use when you start to do large ray traces. Uh, another thing you can do with simulation mode is using here under tools the simulation file manager and then that .sim the sim file that's saved once you run the irradiant once you run that simulation mode ray trace you can go back it in a future point and open the irradiance map again you go to the simulation file manager and then you browse to the sim file that was created with that model and then you click view and it'll open up the irradiance map so this lets you see that the data without rerunning that ray trace. And just wrap up simulation mode here, kind of a, a typical workflow uh, that I would normally use when I'm running, running a ray trace, say where I need to run a large number of rays, say I'm looking for uniformity across a surface or to get a high resolution image. I'd create the initial model, apply all my properties, build my model, uh, work on the geometry, set up my sources. I run the initial ray trace in analysis mode with a low number of rays. And, and low is relative. It could be a, a thousand, it could be a million rays, uh, depending on what I need to see that those initial results. Then I'll, I'll refine the model based on that those initial results. I'll switch over to simulation mode, increase the number of rays. It may be a factor of 10 or a factor of 100. Uh, just trace a very large number of rays. And then you can start looking at higher resolution results for the irradiance maps, the candela plots, the 3D irradiance maps. Uh, so you could see much um, much <coughs> better looking irradiance maps, say, for looking for uniformity. You may be able to turn off smoothing uh, and increase the number of pixels being displayed. OK, now let's take a look at determining the memory usage by Trace Pro. It's always a good idea to have a feel for how much memory the ray trace is going to use because um, you don't want to run out of RAM because uh, you can start to see some, some strange performance. You can see crashes. You can see your computer locking up. It's, it's just it's running out of memory and it can't do anything more. For this example, I'm going to take a look. This is a little LED light. It has seven LEDs on a circular lens array. Uh, you'll see this model pop up. Uh, a few more times here uh, throughout today's webinar. Uh, I've based a lot of the examples on this one model. Once again, our new 3D irradiance map on the surface here. 
I took this model and I ran it in three different ways. I first opened up the Windows Task Manager. Uh, this is, and then the Performance tab, and this is the way it looks in Windows 7, uh, the 64-bit version. If you're running Windows XP, it may look a little different, uh, but in this case we're seeing the, the RAM, the memory available, as well as the CPU usage. Before I did anything, I'd already used up almost 2.9 gig of RAM. Now this is everything that's happening in the background of my computer. Uh, I've got Skype open, a few other programs, and they're, they're using up a, a given amount of RAM, as well as the, the Trace Pro model itself, though in this case it's, it's a relatively simple model. So first thing I did is I traced 350,000 rays. My RAM now went up to 3.62 gig, which tells me I used 0.73, or about three quarters of a gig of RAM to run this 350,000 rays. I then went and traced three and a half million rays, so 10 times the rays. Now I'm up to seven and a half gig, and I've only have eight gig on my computer, so this is about the limit of what I'd be able to do staying in analysis mode. And this now my memory usage just by the ray trace is up to about 4.6 gig. So one way you can look at, see how much memory you're using, and what I'd say is if you think you might get into a problem, run a ray trace with a smaller number of rays, take a look at these results, and then extrapolate out to your larger number of rays. Another thing you can look at is in Trace Pro itself, and this is under the Reports menu, and then it's uh, Ray Trace Report. And the ray trace report will tell you a couple things, the elapsed time for the ray trace, and it'll also tell you ray trace memory. In this case, this 350k ray trace took 0.19 gig, the 3.5 million took 1.94, so 10 times as much, uh, for going for 10 times as many rays. And this brings up a quick question here is, how come that's a smaller number than what I saw using the Windows uh, Task Manager. So why is there a difference uh, in the RAM used uh, as reported by the Windows Task Manager as opposed to the Trace Pro Ray Trace report? Well, what happens is the Ray Trace report only shows you the amount of memory used for the Ray Trace itself. Additional tasks such as displaying the rays, opening an irradiance map or a candela plot, really anything else you do in Trace Pro consumes additional memory. So the Windows Task Manager is always going to be the more accurate method for determining memory usage and availability. You can get a quick idea after you run a ray trace what it looks like using that, using the ray trace report. Uh, but I think to take into account everything that else is running on your computer, you really want to start looking at that Task Manager to determine are you going to have enough RAM to run the ray trace you want. Okay, enough about now simulation mode and the memory usage. Let's talk about a few different topics in Trace Pro and hopefully you know, give you some ideas or maybe some hints on doing some things um, that may make, your, may make your job a little bit easier. Uh, first thing is using the surface source editor to modify applied surface source properties. I'm going to go back to my same model here and in this case I have seven LEDs set up in this model. Not that bad of a number, but say I was making another light source and I had a hundred or a thousand LEDs. Now if I want to go in and change those, if I want to change the, the number of rays I'm tracing, the scale factor, so the, the output of each LED, or if I want to change the, the property applied, if I'm using a Luxian Rebel neutral white LED and I want to see the result with a Luxian Rebel cool white LED. Well, one way to do this is I could go into each of these objects, each of these LEDs, open it up, find the surface that has the surface source property, change the property, go on to the next one, and go down through the line. Not bad if you have two or three, but if you have a large number, seven, or as I mentioned, a hundred or a thousand, uh, that gets to be pretty onerous. So the solution is to use the surface source editor in Trace Pro. Now this is found, it's in the define menu, so go to define surface source editor, and it'll open up a spreadsheet showing all the surface source properties in your model. So here I see my objects, LED 1 through 7, 
In this case, each one of them, I have the, the output surface, or the surface where the property is applied named the same, in this case emitter. You can see it's a source property. I can see the total number of rays, the minimum rays, the emissivity uh, scale or scale factor that I have applied, as well as the catalog and the actual individual uh, property that's applied. And this is what we can use to change these. If I want to change, say, for example, the total number of rays that I'm tracing, I want to scale it up or down, I can just click on the header here, the header column, and it'll highlight the entire column. Then you click Modify, Modify Selection, and this will let us either scale the factor. I could say Scale by 10, click Scale. It'll now trace uh, 500,000 rays instead of 50,000 rays per source. Or I could also set a discrete value. If I knew I wanted to trace 750,000 rays per source, type in 750,000, click Set To, and it'll adjust the number of rays for the entire, uh, for all the sources. I can also go in and select individual sources just by clicking on them and edit them one at a time as well. So if you wanted to put different numbers of rays on different sources, you don't have to change them all at the same time. The one thing, the two things really that you can't change in mass here is the catalog and the name. If you want to change the LED property, as I mentioned, if I want to go to a Luxian cool white instead of neutral white, I need to do that one at a time here. So I'd click on the drop-down box, select the new property, and then when we close this window by clicking the X here, it applies all those changes. So you'd, if you're changing the material prop or the surface source property there, using this editor, it's one at a time. There is a way to do those all at once, though. If we used what's called Advanced Select in Trace Pro, and this is a feature where if you want to do this, you're going to want to step, you're going to want to download Trace Pro uh, 713 Early Access. Uh, this capability was enhanced for this uh, as part of this new release. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to go to Edit, Select, and Advanced. In doing that, opens up the Advanced Selection dialog box here. And I'm going to choose for my selection type, surface source. And now I know I'm going to want to change the Luxian Rebel and the neutral white. So I, from my drop-down menus, my available items here, I'll choose the catalog as Luxian Rebel, and then the Rebel neutral white, and then choose select all. And what that does is it goes through your model tree here, your system tree, and it'll highlight all the surfaces that have that Luxian Rebel neutral white uh, LED property on it. And then to change the property, just right click on any one of them, open up the Apply Properties dialog box, go to Surface Source, and change your property there, and then click Apply. And that change will be applied to all of the selected, uh, selected surfaces. So if you have a thousand LEDs in your model, uh, use this to select them, and then just pick one of them do the right click, open up that apply properties, and change the properties all at once. So a very easy way to change your properties without having to go into every one of them one at a time. Okay, let's talk a little bit about moving and grouping objects in the model tree uh, for better organization. Starting back with Trace Pro 7.0, we, we gave the ability to drag and drop objects within the model tree. Uh, as well as to add what's called object groups. And this lets you move objects around here in the model tree to better organize it, make it look the way you want it to. To do this, just right click in the, in the system tree or the model tree window here and select Enable Drag and Drop. Then you can just go in, left click on the object you want, hold the button down and drag it to the position you want it in the system tree let you reorganize that tree to whatever way you want. You can also go one step further and add object groups. An object group give, lets you give it a name and to do this just come down here once again right click choose new object group and it'll insert an object group here into the model tree. In this case it says new group you can type in any name you want. 
the one uh, caveat here is you, you also want to make sure you have enable drag and drop and drag uh, turned on. So we'll go in here, we'll insert our object group, we'll give it a name, then we can just go and drag the appropriate objects into that object group. And I did that with this example. I, I have two object groups, lamp assembly and arc segments. And now what I've done is I've dragged these objects all into the appropriate one. I have five arc segments here. It's collapsed right now, but I put all the appropriate objects into the lamp assembly. But a couple advantages of this. It makes things very easy to locate. You can find where they are in the model uh, or where they are in that model tree. But also it makes for a more compact uh, model or system tree. Because now if I, if I collapse lamp assembly, I only have two items uh, visible in my system tree as opposed to say a dozen. Um, like I said, not bad with, with a dozen or 15 objects, but when you get and you have you know, say a thousand objects, it, it gets to be uh, very, uh, very cumbersome to move up and down that system tree and find what you want. So a way to organize and, and keep things a little simpler. Now I want to show you a couple shortcuts for panning and orbiting the model view. And the standard way of doing this would be to go up to the toolbar and click on either the pan icon or the orbit icon and then go down into your model, left click and if you've chosen pan you can pan the model left and right, up, down, however you want or if you've clicked on orbit you can come down and you can orbit or tumble the model so you can rotate around it and see different views. So very easy to do just going up to the toolbar. But there's a couple other ways to do this as well. We can do it just from the keyboard without actually having to turn the icons on and off. Uh, if we do a control right click, then we can drag the pan, drag uh, to pan the model view around. Or if we do a shift right click and then drag and we can orbit the model. So we can do the same thing as the icons just without actually having to go up and click the icons. Another way to do it is in the lower left of your Trace Pro model window, you have this three colored UCS or the XYZ axes. If you want to rotate the view, just go down, left click on any of the, the colored axes, hold the left button down and move it around and you can tumble the model that way. If you double click on any of these axes, it'll rotate the model so that axis, axis is pointed into the screen. And then if you double click on this shaded area that you see here, this dark shaded area between the, the axes, it'll switch to a plan view of your model. So a way to actually do a lot of the, the same um, orbiting without even having to, to do anything else on the keyboard. Just go down to the, the uh, UCS icon there in the, the lower left hand corner. And then I want to talk a little bit about detect rays starting in bodies. Uh, and before I get too far here, again, I want to remind folks that uh, any questions that you have as we're going along, uh, please feel free to use that uh, question box on the go to, go to webinar control panel. I also want to make note that we'll, we archive all of our, of our webinars, so we'll be putting a recording of this webinar up on our website, and it'll probably be up within the next day or so. So if you want to go back, um, re-download it, listen to the, the webinar, uh, we'll also put a copy of the slides there as well. So that, that's available to you in the future. So detect rays starting in bodies. One assumption TracePro makes with ray traces is it assumes that rays are starting in air. The problem can come is if you actually have your rays starting inside of an object that has a different index of refraction than air. Um, say for an example, a, an LED chip embedded inside of, a, of an epoxy dome or a plastic dome. Um, and this really where this comes into play is with embedded objects like this. So what I have here is I have a dome made out of acrylic with a, an index of refraction of 1.49. I have air to the outside here, which is an index of 1. And I traced just a simple grid source because I wanted the, you know, an LED chip is obviously not going to emit like this, but for simplification purposes, I had all the rays collimated just to show the effect here. 
And what we're seeing is the rays are coming out and they're refracting and actually spreading out, which is the opposite of what we would, we would want them to do. And what's happening is Trace Pro, as I mentioned, is, is thinking these rays are starting in air. It's coming to this surface and saying, okay, there's an index of 1.49 associated with that surface and thinking that that index is out here. So the way to fix this is we go to Ray Trace, Ray Trace Options and Options, and click the box here next to Detect Rays Starting in Bodies. Now Trace Pro knows to check now that where are these rays starting, and it comes out and we see the expected behavior. Here we have a, a, an acrylic to air interface. We see the rays uh, refracting in the, in the proper direction. So it's something to keep in mind if you're embedding objects uh, inside of other objects. Okay. So let's keep going here. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the irradiance and illuminance maps and the candela plots. First off, let's take a look at the irradiance maps, or radiance or illuminance maps. Now, the only difference between an irradiance map and an illuminance map is irradiance means you're in radiometric units, so you'd be looking at watts or watts per meter squared. Illuminance is the photometric version of that. Uh, now, our units would be visible light units, so it'll be lux, lumens, and foot candles. Uh, so really the, the two are not quite interchangeable, but they, they give you this similar information. Just one is in radiometric, one is in photometric. Uh, if you have any interest in really digging into what the, all the units are, uh, we did a, a webinar recently on radiometry and photometry in TracePro, and that's available on our website. Uh, so feel free to, to download that as well. So what I'm doing here is I have this LED spotlight. I mentioned we'll be seeing this more than once in today's webinar. And I have most of my rays focused here where I want them. But I have these rays out on the edges. And my interest here is I want to see where those rays are coming from. So the radiance maps give you the ability to do that. So we'll take a look at the, that actual radiance map for this surface here. In this case, I have it set to log scale, so I can really bring up the detail on these, uh, these little clusters here in the corners. And again, what, what I'm looking for is the, I want to see where the rays hitting this part are coming from. Now, the way we do that is using what's called display selected rays. And the first step is to drag a box around the area of interest. And we do this by doing a shift and then a left click and drag that box around the area that you're interested in. In this case, I highlighted it in black to make it a little clearer on the screen, but it's usually a, like a thin white or gray outline around the area. So we can drag that around our area that we want to see where those rays are coming from. And then we go up to the analysis menu and choose display selected rays, or while we're still in that irradiance or illuminance map window, we can do a right click and choose display selected rays. And what Trace Pro will now do is it will only show you the rays that are hitting that area. And for what I'm looking for here, more importantly, they'll show me where the rays are and where they're coming from in these sources. So if I rotate this around and zoom in a little bit, I can see Remembering uh, the standard ray collars in TracePro, the red rays have the highest flux. When that flux drops below 66.6% .6 of initial, the rays are green. And then when it drops below 33.3%, uh, they're blue. So if I look at my red rays here, here, and here, they're coming from the edges of these lens arrays. So it's light that's leaking around my little lenslets. Well, one way we could solve this is to go in and actually paint those elements black uh, to absorb that light. Now we'll get more of our light light pretty much exclusively in that center section. We won't have that stray light kind of making a halo effect around the around our center section. Uh, so this was a way that using that display selected rays could get me that information, show me where those rays are coming from and where I have to look to make changes in my model. 
another spot where I've, I've looked at this before and done this is with reflector design. If you're designing a reflector and you want to evenly illuminate an area or illuminate an area to a given pattern, run the ray trace, look at the irradiance maps, and then you may see hot spots or cold spots where you don't have enough light or you have too much light. Well, you can use that, that um, select rays, highlight the area you want, go to display selected rays, and have it show you where, where in your reflector those rays are coming from. So now you know where you have to go in and, and edit or make changes. Another thing with 3D irradiance, with the irradiance maps, is the new feature here in Trace Pro 7.1 is the 3D irradiance maps. What the 3D irradiance maps allows you to do is see the distribution of light on multiple surfaces at one time. Uh, in this case, I'm showing the, the true color mode. In my model here, I have a little um, crossed Zerni turn of spectrometer. My rays are coming in here. I, I have the rays turned off for clarity. They're coming in. I have a collimating mirror. It collimates that, those rays, it hits the grating. The grating then splits the light up into the different wavelengths, and here we see the different colors, and we can see that through the back of this focusing mirror. And the focusing mirror then focuses those down on the detector. And so we're seeing our, our light from blue to red here on our detector, say it's a, a photodiode array. So now what we can see is very quickly What's the distribution of light? Where's the position of the beam in each of these things? And I can see, I mean, I'm vignetting here a little bit, so I may want to you know, rotate my collimating mirror a bit to focus it here. I could see if I had rays going off and missing my detector, you know, what's happening? So it's a, another useful tool to let you see those irradiance maps on multiple surfaces. Um, and the way you do that is just select the surfaces you want in the model tree, and then go up to Analysis, 3D Irradiance Maps. Another thing you could do is what's called path sorting. I mentioned previously uh, path sorting uh, does a uh, sorts the rays into different paths. If we run a ray trace and then go to analysis path sort table, it opens up this little spreadsheet here. And it shows you all the paths that the rays are sorted into. In this case, the, really the top ones are these these top seven, and that's actually the number of wavelengths I, I traced in this model. And it'll show you the, the wavelength, the number of rays, the flux, the percentage of rays that are in that path. And you can sort and order these by clicking on these columns. What you can also do is use display selected paths to show each one of these paths in the model. So I highlighted this top path. It's at 0.55 microns. And what I can do is I just click here on the left, it'll highlight that, and then I'll go to Analysis, Display Selected Pass, and it'll show just those rays over here in the model tree, the model view. Uh, if I have an irradiance map open for this surface as well, we'll see just those rays. So here, 0.55 microns, green light, we see the green spot on my detector. So another way you can, you can use multiple tools in, in TracePro to sort down and see just the rays of interest. You can do some similar things in the candela plots. Uh, again, my same model here. And I opened up an ISO candela plot on that window or on that, that target. And the ISO candela plot shows you, in this case it's the polar ISO candela plot, it shows you the angular distribution of light in the polar angles as well as azimuth angles. So this is the equivalent of putting a hemisphere over that, that axis of that, that light and seeing the angular distribution. And if I want to find out the light into a given area, what I can do is I can go to Analysis, Display Selected Rays, and then once I've clicked that, I go back to Analysis and choose Select Rays. It's actually the reverse of the way you do it in the irradiance map. Um, and that'll open up the Select Rays dialog box here. And then we can define our polar angles, our min and max polar angles, and our minimum and maximum azimuth angles. Click Set. And it'll show you the number of lumens and the solid angle that, that makes up that cone or that zone that you've just defined. Uh, another little shortcut here is you, if you're in this ISO Candela plot, uh, doing a right click lets you 
um, well then you can then go to display selected rays or select rays uh, without having to go up to the menu items. So a way of, of seeing, um, seeing the number of lumens in a given zone for your uh, candela plot. Uh, the candela plots will also allow you to make IES or LDT, LUMDAT files. So if you're taking your models and you want to export that data to be used in another program such as uh, Light, Oxytex LightStar 4D or Dialux or AGI32, you can save this data as IES files. And to do that, run your ray trace, open a candela plot, and then go do a right click and choose uh, Save As and then change the file type to, in this case, like IES, IESNA LM63 or to LDT, and it'll open up the appropriate dialog box. It'll let you save this say, as an IES file. I would also uh, suggest if you're working with IES files, check out our October 2010 webinar, which was uh, focused exclusively on IES and LDT files in TracePro. So there's a lot of information there on the, the proper settings for the, these file defaults. Okay, now I want to touch on the, the flux threshold. Uh, it's something that happens in the back, background in TracePro, but it can be fairly important. The flux threshold setting in TracePro determines when TracePro will stop keeping track of rays. So once the rays fall below the flux threshold, they're terminated. TracePro doesn't keep track of them anymore. The default setting for this flux threshold is 0.05 or 5% of the initial uh, flux value. So once a ray falls below that 5% of its initial value, it'll be terminated. You can change the flux thresholds by just going to ray trace, ray trace options, and then thresholds. And one thing you can do is you can use the flux report in TracePro to determine are you, how many, how many rays or how much of your flux is being lost to it falling below the flux threshold. So to demonstrate this, I made this simple model. I have a, an acrylic light guide here with an LED source. I ran the ray trace, and then I went to reports, flux, opened up the flux report, and I'm looking here. There's a column that says lost flux threshold. This is showing me the number of lumens in this case. This is a, a visible light or a, a photometric ray trace. The number of lumens that are lost due to them falling below that flux threshold. I have about 99.9 .9 lumens incident on my light guide here. In this case, I'm lo losing 5.5 lumens to the flux threshold. That means about 5.44% of the light of the the flux or the light in the model uh, really is is being lost. So your this would be an error if you, you your results would be off by they could be off by five percent in this case. So in something like this, we want to see we want to lower that flux threshold. So if I went to that um, ray trace ray trace options thresholds changed my flux threshold from 5% down to 0.5%, reran the ray trace, and now we see our flux loss to the threshold is down to 0.234 lumens, or just under a quarter of a percent. So now we can have much more accurate results. We're, we're not losing light uh, that should really be contributing to our final result. So it's always good to take a look at this uh, flux report to see where, where you're losing light um, and if you need to make changes to, say, the flux threshold. Uh, another quick tip I like to tell people is applying properties before copying. Let's say we want to make an array of LEDs. Uh, in this case, this is a 100, array, 100 LED array, 10 by 10. And you can use, in TracePro, move, copy, or rotate copy to make arrays of objects. But what I always suggest is make a single object first. Use that as your base object. Apply all of your properties to that one object. Then do your move copy or rotate copy. And by doing that, all the properties are copied with the object. So you're not having to go back in, in this case, into 100 objects and apply the properties one at a time. 
Uh, so easy way to do that. Just apply it first, then do your array. Okay, the, the last subject here on, on Trace Pro, before we get into a, a little bit on the optimizers, we'll talk about speeding up the ray trace. A Trace Pro does what's called voxelization. And voxelization is a way of allocating the geometry in the model to specific zones. Uh, Trace Pro will create these 3D pixels or voxels, these cubes that surround the model. And by knowing you what know, those cubes, the ray can determine if there's an object in that, if there's not. Uh, if you increase the number of voxels, you can get a faster ray trace speed. Uh, the the trade-off is that the audit, the initial audit that happens when you start a ray trace, will take longer because if you increase those numbers of voxels, it takes longer to calculate where everything is. But you can then again get a faster ray trace. And there's two types of voxels in TracePro, octree and uniform. The default is octree, sorry, the default is uniform, and uniform creates equally sized, equally spaced 3D voxels across the system. So all the voxels are going to be the same size, same shape. Uh, Octree voxelization concentrates objects, concentrates the vo voxels near objects and then places fewer and larger voxels in empty spaces. Uh, a good, good case where this may be would be a model that had a large space between objects or a large space between your source and your, your uh, detector. Uh, a couple examples would be, say, uh, a room light, a luminaire, and the floor of the room or if you're doing a street light or a parking lamp where the, the lamp may be you know, 30 feet or so above the ground and you have this large empty space. You can change your voxel settings by going to ray trace, ray trace options and then choosing advanced. And here we can see for example switching between the, the types of voxels uniform to octree. I have a little example here that that shows a, a fluorescent fixture mounted, in this case, 10 meters above the ground. And I want to see, I'm going to use this as my ray trace. You know, perfect example here. We have a large amount of space between objects. So instead of doing this with uniform voxels, we change the voxels to octree by going to that, uh, that setting ray trace, ray trace options advanced. And we can see here it places more and smaller voxels around the source and the floor of my target and larger lower concentration of voxels in the empty space. And if you want to see these voxels in really in any model, it's just go to view display voxels and it'll show them, show the way it's been set up. Uh, the one trick there is you need to have run the audit first so it can calculate that space. In this model, the, the octree version actually ray traced 56% faster than the uniform voxel version. So it's a, it's a worthwhile gain when you're doing something like that, when you have a lot of, lot of space, switch over to that uh, octree voxels. Okay, the last couple things I want to talk about here today is a, a few tips for the interactive optimizer. Uh, interactive optimizer is uh, part of TracePro. Uh, standard and expert. Uh, it's been out now for a year and a half, two years. Uh, hopefully everybody's had a chance to use it. <coughs> Excuse me. Now in the optimizer you have the sketch window and you can draw rays in this sketch window just by left clicking and dragging the rays in the direction you want. And you can draw rays one at a time like that. But sometimes you may want to put in a ray fan or a beam of rays. And there's a quick and easy way to do that. If we want to do a ray fan, start by the way you'd normally draw a ray, left click, drag the ray in the direction you want it to go, and then press control and sweep left or right, and it'll make this fan of rays. So we'd, we would drag a ray, and then we'd sweep left or right to make this fan of rays. If we want to make a beam, a parallel beam, once again, it's drag your ray the way you normally would, hold down the shift key, and go left or right, depending on which direction you want to make the beam in. In this case, I would to make this beam here, we'd 
drag this ray up, hold the shift key, and then drag the mouse in this direction. It'll make a parallel beam of light. A uh, quick way to add a lot of rays to your, to your sketch window. And another thing in the optimizer is when you set up the optimization, one of the, one of the things you have to set up is your variables. And the variables are the points they're going to be allowed to move to change the geometry to meet your, your optimization goal, whether it's in a radiance map or a, a candela distribution. One option is what's called a relative variable. And a relative variable, we select the variable we want, and then we just assign a positive and negative and x, x and y values. So in this case, they're two. So this variable can, will be allowed to move two millimeters in the x and the y direction. So it can move in this box here. A quick, easy way to set up the variables. Where you can run into a problem with relative variables is if you stop the optimization after the control point is moved, saved that SOD file, say you wanted to come back to this optimization, then reopened it. And now because this variable has been defined as relative, the limits the plus or minus two millimeters are relative to where this point is at. So this point was here, it's now moved over to here. So this means this point can actually now move, in this case, almost right up to the center line. And the reason you want to be careful with these relative variables is in a case like this, if this moved even a little more, we could start to create geometry that, that's bad geometry where we start getting self-intersecting segments. Whereas if this point moved across this center line, you start to get some strange results. So if you're using relative variables, you just want to keep an eye on, on what's happening and, and where they're at and make sure their limits won't let them uh, intersect with other segments. So another way around this is to use what's called absolute variables. And in absolute variables, you enter in the limits, the upper and lower limits as discrete values. So if we look at this point, it may be a little hard to see, but this point is at x is equal to 3, y is equal to 10. And I defined, I changed my variable type here to absolute. Now my lower limit is 1, my upper limit is 5. So here's my lower limit, 1, upper limit 5. It's the same plus or minus 2, but it's defined absolutely now as opposed to being relative to this variable. And then same thing for my, my vertical. My lower limit is 8, my upper is 12, so the same plus or minus 2, but defined in absolute terms. So now if I do the same thing, if I let the optimization run, stopped it after that point moved, saved the, the .sod, the optimization file of the same name, reopened it, the variables moved, but my limits are still going to be uh, from 1 to 5 and 8 to 12. So it takes a little bit more work initially to set them up using absolute variables, but uh, it can save you some, some headache when you start running into possibly generating self-intersecting geometry. Whoops. Okay, well, before we touch on this next thing, that really uh, finishes up my presentation for today. Um, I'd want again, we'll throw out the option here. Anybody that has any questions, feel free to, to type them in using that question box in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. Uh, and we'll be addressing those in a few minutes. But I'll bring back in uh, Andy Knight. Uh, if he wants to come back in here, first thing we'll talk about is our current promotions we have. Uh, we, we currently have a promotion uh, starting actually April 1st on Oslo. I don't know if we have any Oslo users in the audience right now, but uh, if they are, this may be applicable. Uh, if a customer's purchased Oslo in the past and they're currently out of support, now they can update to the current release of Oslo, in this case Oslo 6.6, uh, with one free year of, of support uh, for one low price. And the price is going to depend on the version of Oslo or the edition of Oslo they have. Is it light, standard, or premium? So as an example here, uh, an Oslo Premium Node Lock license that's two years out of support, then the cost of the customer to upgrade to 6.6 would be $1,500. If they're 10 years out of support, it's the same cost, $1,500. So it's a way to get up to the current version of Oslo um, 
as far if you're uh, out of support. Uh, if anybody's interested in this, please contact us here at um, either at sales at lambdares.com or uh, we, a few minutes here, I'll put up our contact information as the last slide. Uh, that finishes my presentation. So I guess if we could take a look at any questions that have come in. Thanks, Dave. Nice yeah. job. Thank you. So yeah, we do have a qu couple questions already. Okay. Uh, the first one being, is it possible to check or uncheck all the objects in a group or selection? You can, well, you could, no, you still need to go in and, and check and uncheck them individually. Uh, the group is basically just a header uh, or an organization tool. So you still want to go in and, and do those individually. Okay. Uh, next one, is it possible to change number of rays shown for a particular path? Uh, could we do, I haven't tried that. We, it's, you, ray, I'd have to check to see if ray sorting would work. What, what I would do is I would run that, display that path, and then go to ray sorting and change the percentage of rays. Uh, that should change that. But uh, I haven't tried that myself, so I will. Um, I'll give that a try. We can always send the 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 question, the person that asked the question. We can send them a note on if that's possible, or feel free to give it a try yourself as well. Okay. Uh, next, is it possible for Trace Pro to calculate beam and field angles for a given light distribution? Well, that's what the, the Candela plot is going to sh show you, is if we go back to the, we go back to our Candela plot here. This is showing us, in this case, this is a the polar iso Candela plot. This is showing us our, our azimuth and polar angles. So these are our beam angles for this, in this case, the spotlight. Uh, another option is the, uh, the Candela distribution plot, which will show you a slice of this data. So to be slicing across here, say along the 0 to 180 axis, and in this case it would show us, you know, a distribution that may look like that. Um, actually, I think I have a, an example further back here. Actually, it's my simulation mode one. Sorry. So here, it's a little hard to see at this resolution, but here's the, the angular distribution for this particular beam, uh, basically a single slice across this data, either in this axis or in this axis. So yes, you use the candela plots to see that, that beam angle. Great. Okay. Uh, uh, next question, is it possible to save all intermediate steps in an optimization to be able to check intermediate geometries later? That's actually saved automatically. Uh, when you set up an optimization, one of the things you're defining is the path uh, where you save that data, and then uh, each iteration is saved in that, uh, that folder that you define. So you can go back at a later date and see those, those different ones, as well as when you're doing the optimization, you the optimization log opens up, and at any time you can stop, go to a given uh, iteration, uh, right-click on it, and say export to Trace Pro, and it'll export that version to Trace Pro for you to take a look at. Excellent. Okay. That is, as of this moment, the last question, so I'll put out one more call for questions uh, in case anybody did have anything that we didn't cover or didn't I'm understand just, something. I'm going to throw up our contact info here as well. That would be good. So as mentioned, anybody who has any questions, uh, please feel free. Drop us a note. Give us a call. Uh, email address, sales at lambdares.com. There we go. Or give us a call here in Littleton, 978-486-0766. Have one more. Is it possible to save the optimization log? I believe that's saved in the when you save the and when you close out. I believe the optimization log is saved. 
uh, but all the results from it, such as a, a Candela plot or a, um, the irradiance maps are also saved in that folder. Great. Well, I think we are pretty much done. Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's session. Um, and we will look forward to seeing everybody at our next webinar. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, the archived copy of this webinar will be up online probably within the next day or so. So it will be available for download and, and re-watching. And with well, that... Thank you all for uh, attending. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Okay. Have a good day. <laughs>